we will talk about the international cultural relations in the digital age. And I'm very happy to introduce Mr. Helmut Anheyer, who is the professor of sociology at the Hertie School. Before he served as president of the Hertie School from 2009 to 2018. He's also a member of the faculty at the University of California, Los Angeles, Luskin School of Public Affairs, and visiting professor at LSE IDs on the London School of Economics and Political Science. He received his PhD from Yale University in 1986, was a senior researcher at the John Hopkins University's Institute for Political Studies and a professor of public policy and social welfare at the University of California, among others. So welcome, Professor Anheyer. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I think it's my turn to, to welcome you on behalf of the Hertie School. Acting uh, President Mark Hallerberg uh, sends his greetings and also his apologies uh, for not being here tonight. As you know, it's Thanksgiving and any respecting uh, American citizen um, is at home with his family having a, a turkey dinner. And that's probably what he's uh, doing right now. Um, we're very, very uh, pleased to uh, host the event tonight. And um, at the Hertie School, uh, as you know, we cover a range of policy fields from finance to infrastructure to public administration and to health. But culture has always been one of the fields that we hold there. We worked with um, the Goethe Institute, the British Council, uh, the Foreign Office here in Berlin over the years. We uh, published the Culture and Globalization Report. We work closely with the Council of Europe uh, to develop an indicator system and how culture, cultural policy and democracy relate to each other. Uh, we worked on soft power approaches with uh, the Foreign Office here, as already mentioned, and uh, we're very, very pleased to have cooperated with uh, IFA over the last few years to develop what we call the External uh, Cultural Policy Monitor, which is, I think, the reason why we have the occasion tonight, because the monitor, about which I'll say a few more words in a moment, has been launched just today. Thank you very much, and congratulations for the launching today. I think it's always something very remarkable when, when we have worked on something so long and then it's the moment of, of giving birth. So, so we will be very happy to, to, to know more about it in a few, few seconds. I, I would like to introduce um, Ms. Odelia Tribel. She's the head of the section Dialogue and Research Culture and Foreign Policy at IFA, which is the Institut für Auslandsbeziehungen, as we say in German. She oversees the IFA edition culture and foreign policy, as well as the IFA input. She is the co-initiator of the International Cultural Relations Research Alliance and publishes on fundamental concepts of international relations. Welcome, Ms. Triebel. It's great to have you with us today. Thank you, Mr. Nasser. Yeah, so it's my part now to welcome you also on behalf of, of IFA. And as it was said, the occasion actually for this online panel discussion tonight is the launch of the ECP monitor. ECP stands for External Cultural Policy. And this monitor uh, is the, the only one in the field that actually covers all sectors in, in the field, like, like media, higher education, language, science, and culture, and also the wide range of countries outside Europe, or as we say, outside the G20 countries. So this is very special. It's an online system that presents key information about the external cultural policy of countries across the world in a systematic way and in the concise way. Regularly updated, it offers quantitative data, context information, and cross-country comparison. And it's a little bit inspired by this kind of information the OECD provides, and was introduced by scientific coordinator Sarah Wiedmeyer at IFA. And when I heard, learned about this idea, I was very intrigued, and we were very proud that we actually could gain the interest and enthusiasm of Professor Anheyer and the support of his excellent team 
because it was not that easy to actually build it up and find the kind of information we were seeking for in order to compare different countries um, in the field. But yeah, it's not only the aim for us um, as a competence center to provide information about the status quo. We also aim for giving impulses for what might be ahead of us in the development of the field of cultural policy and cultural relations. So when we are asking for, for the impact of digitalization, we're asking ourselves if it might be all these developments change the entire socio-political field, maybe, that we have come to know so far during the last two decades. But first, please allow me to introduce Eva a little bit to the audience. The IFA Institute für Auslandsbeziehungen is Germany's oldest intermediary organization for international cultural relations. We support artistic and civil society exchange worldwide and research on international cultural relations. We are convinced that we need research because we need evidence base in the social political field, but also because we need research which examines the status quo of international cultural relations and includes the views and needs of partners and partner countries to better implement foreign cultural policy. The Monitor is part of a HIFA hub culture and foreign policy. This is an online platform currently being built up by IFA to research, network and explore information on international cultural relations from all over the world. We aim at enabling and improving research into international cultural relations by gathering, curating and making available relevant data. And the ECP monitor will be part of this hub. So maybe you keep in touch with us and look forward to the next beginning of quarter of next year. As we, as this kind of competence center, understand ourselves, also give impulses and discuss developments in the field, we also uh, were inspired for this discussion tonight and are very uh, glad to, and, and thank you very much that this excellence, excellency of speakers um, accepted uh, our invitation. The topic raises many questions. Like I said, might it even really change the entire field? And um, what, how can we actually um, deal with with might be being built up on the of or shaping at the at, at the horizon? So we are asking what what are some of the main challenges of digitalization for institutions and practitioners of external cultural relations? What are successful strategies? how to cope with these challenges and how to harness the opportunities. But also be very careful at who is using what for what. Given the speed of these developments, how we can we better anticipate and not only react as we very often do. Before handing over to the host of today's discussion, Sami Nazar, again, I really like to thank the panelists who accepted the invitations. Um, I thank you very much the audience for your interest and also again our excellencies of cooperation partners at the Hertie School. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Treble. Um, and I would like immediately now to hand over to Mr. Anheyer. And actually, this is also my opportunity to introduce Mr. Edward Knudsen, who is a research associate at the Hertie School. His focus lays on transatlantic politics and economics. He also gained work experience researching economic history at the University of California, Berkeley, and Humboldt University in Berlin. So welcome the both of you, and we are very, very much eager now to hear your presentation about the index. So. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Here we are. Uh, this presentation comes in, in two parts. Um, uh, we will, uh, of course, focus on digitalization and um, external cultural policy uh, as, as input to the panel discussion. But before that, uh, we wanted to introduce the uh, external cultural uh, policy monitor. As, as I'm sure all of you know, um, uh, external cultural policy has grown in, in relevance over uh, the last uh, decades, and in uh, while we have more actors and uh, in some cases also more funding and more activity going on, um, we we do have a problem when it comes to uh, information and data, particular data that is comparable that gives us in a very succinct and systematic way the lay of the land, what different countries do 
in culture policy as part of the external affairs. And the monitor was developed, as we, we just heard, as a cooperative project to fill in the major gaps that exist across countries, but also across fields. And these are uh, the five or six main fields in which external cultural policy takes place. Language policies, education, science and research, culture and art in a more narrow sense, and of course, media. Digitalization goes all across of these fields, and that's why it has become such an important uh, topic. So the objective of the external cultural policy monitor is to uh, offer on an online basis uh, information and data, but also interpretation to a diverse audience of practitioners, policymakers, professionals, experts, and of course, students of international relations and cultural policy. The uh, monitor uh, covers now uh, over 30 countries and we're aiming for more. Uh, we cover seven fields. I already mentioned them. And we have a comparative data set in the, main, in the making for at the moment 25 uh, plus countries. So when you go on the website for the monitor, uh, which is largely organized by country, you will see that there are five elements that come with each country uh, that you, you see. It is first of all a report uh, that on typically 12 to 15 pages gives you an interpretive overview of the external cultural policy of a country. And then you'll also see a fact sheet that gives you the main indicators that you need. And then a summary of each country. It is a summary of the country report. So that is for users who don't have the time to read 15 odd pages of prose and charts and figures, but what just want to have the gist of it. And then as a service item, uh, there is a full reference uh, section with uh, the web links that might be useful for those who would like to follow up on one aspect or another. And I already mentioned that we have now six or seven comparative reports that cover language uh, policies, science policies, media, and the like. So that is the EZP uh, monitor. And here you have an overview of the countries that we uh, cover uh, so far. And we hope to add more countries in the future. Right? And that brings me then to one of those topics that cut across the various parts or elements of cultural policy, external cultural policy, I should say. And that is the digital realm. Now, what do we mean by that? Um, it is for external cultural policy, any of the ways and means of digital technology that states and state aligned institutions use to enhance, supplement, or otherwise replace existing strategies as well as activities. So uh, it is the digital that comes on top or sometimes uh, in addition to the analog ECP efforts as it were. So what has been happening in ECP and the digital? First, we find that a number of actors and the voices involved have increased uh, because we have lower barriers of entry into the field. Right? It is also less centralized. In many cases, we have state actors that have become more uh, non-state actors that have become more important. And the relationship between the, the, the national state and the various other actors that utilize digital ECP elements is more diffuse. And that overlaps with a third development or implication uh, that we have more stealth opportunities and capabilities. In other words, there are more clandestine operations going on that um, implement uh, new ways in reaching into the audiences and 
publics in abroad, uh, abroad, right? And that is the famous echo chamber phenomenon as one example of it. And at the same time, we have greater speed in which think, things happen, in which contact is disseminated. There is more agility in changing strategy. That's because transaction costs and costs of reorganizations have significantly dropped. And we have, in addition to the uh, usual um, suspects, you might say, um, the United States, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, we have also smaller institutions and uh, sometimes well-funded institutions, smaller states, coming in and start competing with the larger and more powerful ones. So there is a shift in capabilities at a geopolitical level. And then we have an increase in the audience size that is being reached, let's say, through Twitter and other social media. And that coincides also with a segmentation of the audience. So there is a targeting going on that was not possible in the analog world. Right? And to some extent, that puts the brick and mortar institution on the defensive because the social media, in a way, administratively far more footloose than established institutions that are tied to budgets and public sector rules and regulation to a much greater extent. Right? And that also speaks to, to the greater agility of the digital ECP compared to the conventional uh, ECP. And finally, because we can measure the digital much more easily in many ways than we can measure comp uh, existing ECP activities. It feeds into a trend that we see in many countries where ECP has to, in a way, prove itself and say, well, we are making an impact and the money you spend on external cultural policy is worthwhile. Right? So digital helps legitimating external cultural policy ex measures and expenditures. And with that, I would like to turn it over to, uh, to Ted. And perhaps Ted, if, uh, uh, so we, we don't have to switch presentations. If you simply tell me when I have to go to the next slide, would that be fine? Yep, absolutely. Okay, here it is. All right, well, thanks everybody. Yeah, I'm, uh... I was introduced earlier, but yeah, I'm Ted Knudsen, um, actually an American citizen not at home eating turkey right now. So sorry to disprove Professor Anheyer's theory. I have my turkey in an hour or so. <laughs> um, but yeah, th thanks so much. I mean, um, Professor Anheyer touched on a lot of the most important points to start here. Um, you know, just, just briefly to give you an idea of these quite well-known um, institutions that we would call, you know, instruments of external cultural policy pulled together here just some social media statistics from the most recent, uh, the most recent data. And, you know, you see um, really for all the broadcasters, almost all of them are, are in the millions for, for both of these networks that we, that we looked at. Um, and you see within there like quite a, quite a big discrepancy, you know, a factor of about, about 5X difference here between the BBC world and, and some of the smaller ones. And so, you know, these are these are selected specifically um, as like the, the flagship of each country. Obviously, there's going to be several different channels and different languages and a different focus. But for the sake of comparability, I took the, the largest English language one in each. And, you know, as well as um, as the broadcasters, where it obviously makes sense where any kind of news media is going to need to transition into the digital space. So you can, of course, expect that to come from the state-backed broadcasters as well. So it's really, it's really no surprise that they're focusing on this, especially focusing on video, depending on the network. Um, but of course you see the actual cultural institutions themselves um, trying to reach an audience here beyond the sort of standard channels that you would, you know, with a language course or a cultural um, set of cultural programming or so on. I mean, that, that's really important because, of course, if you're, you know, the Goethe Institute or something, you're, you're typically going to be in capital cities of other countries and maybe some other like big economic centers. So it's a little more difficult to reach people outside of that. Having 
a social media audience and an online presence enables you to do that. Um, and then you'll see all this data. Um, this is all you know, going to be online in our report. We get into that. So I won't dwell on this too much, but just to give you an idea of some of the, the comparison statistics here, uh, we could do the next slide. And so, yeah, aside from just the, the numbers here, you know, what do we actually mean and what are we talking about when we, when we look at these examples of external cultural policy? You know, there's um, digital tools in external cultural policy. Obviously, there's like, there's, you know, thousands and thousands, like there's, there's way more than you can count um, because it's so, so integrated into the practice of this now, but just a few that I thought were noticeable and I think that they highlight different points that, that Professor Anheuer made earlier in the presentation. There's the UK's uh, great campaign. Um, if you've flown into Heathrow or anywhere, you've probably seen that before. And so this is really, um, you know, in some ways you could say this is like a, a pretty standard kind of nation branding campaign that you'd see. However, of course, this is an example of using digital tools to, to complement that and add to, to something else that might have that might have occurred previously. And it's really been widely hailed and emulated. For example, Brazil has kind of explicitly modeled some of their promotion efforts off of this. Russia, of course, um, has become kind of, I guess, notorious for some of its uh, application of digital tools to foreign relations. You know, this was uh, obviously documented quite extensively with the 2016 U.S. election and the subsequent Mueller investigation. Uh, there's also been, you know, some reports of other countries emulating this. Uh, there's been reports, you know, of uh, China acting in a similar way to influence elections in Taiwan and so on. And so this is like a this is a, a real direct application of digital tools to, to um, foreign influence and foreign policy, you know, should obviously state that, you know, countries have found their own ways to do this, you know, during the Cold War, obviously, there's a, there's a long legacy of the US and other powers um, trying, to, trying to affect electoral outcomes in this way. But of course, the way you can do it now with, you know, the bot farms and these, these, uh, these like troll farms, they call them, and the way you can really, as Professor Anher said, directly target certain groups. Um, and so there was evidence, right, that uh, that specifically sort of like marginalized groups or people that might have had a kind of axe to grind with the status quo um, were specifically targeted as seen as a bit more susceptible to kind of foreign, foreign information, foreign influence. We also talked about the way that digital tools can actually replace other ones. And so I think that's also important to note here. It's, it's not always just a matter of adding when you talk about digital tools is, for example, uh, Radio Netherlands Worldwide, which was, you know, a, a sort of like the, the BBC equivalent of the Netherlands, really a quite a time-honored institution, They've been around since 1947. They had budget cuts of about 70% in 2013, and then switched to an online-only service that year. And so in this way, having the opportunity to go online kind of enabled in a way the cuts because they didn't have to completely get rid of the brand. They just got rid of their previous service and said, okay, well, this still exists in an online presence. And so it's actually a way, if you're gonna try to maintain a minimalist posture in some ways, you can just rely on digital tools exclusively. Um, in terms of international cooperation on this, you know, you have um, just one example, this site called Info Migrants uh, with France and Germany originally cooperating, some other European countries joining in. They say they've now reached 5 million people with their online offerings as a, try to, a way to try to give accurate information to, um, to migrants. And, and so it just gives you, gives you an idea of this sort of spectrum that we talked about of either kind of innovating new ways to use these tools, complementing existing ones, or just outright replacing old ones. And I think hanging over all of this really, um, we have to talk about, and I tried to illustrate these with the, the two photos on the, the opening slide or the first one of Arab Spring and the second one, the Mueller report sort of bookending the, the 2010s, right? And I think indicative of the changing perspective towards what digital tools could offer in the international space where it started out in the decade fairly optimistic. And I think you close the decade being pretty, with a lot of people being a lot more wary of what these could actually do to democracy. Um, and so not seeing them just as a tool to sort of spread, spread freedom and open expression, but also there's sort of this counter move of maybe those can be used to, to curtail or inflame certain forms of unhelpful type of expression. And so I think that's, yeah, that's a, has, to, has to be addressed and I think really, really shapes the entire kind of the entire dialogue that I assume we'll have later as well, really 
the, the most the past decade was a very big turning point. And so just a few questions. I'm sure the panelists will all have their own, you know, um, their own research they want to present and the discussion can, can go in that direction as well. But a few questions that came up in my research for this that, you know, I really didn't, uh, a lot of these, it, it, it's difficult to answer and, you know, coming, doing research about such a relatively new and changing topic, in some ways you're left with more questions and answers the more you look into it, as I'm sure uh, plenty of colleagues that work on this topic know. But a few things that come to mind that could prompt some discussion is, you know, how does this change of digital external culture policy, how does that compare to other earlier innovations? You know, there's people are always saying every time something new rolls out that this is going to be innovative, this is going to change everything. In some ways, maybe that just actually entrenches existing hierarchies rather than disrupting them. Um, so how digital compares to, to earlier innovations, I think is an important thing to discuss. Um, specifically from like a policy side, you know, what, what can be done to actually counter some of this misinformation uh, and the problem of so-called echo chambers. And yeah, you know, who, who benefits from this, you know, what are the, uh, who are the main, yeah, the, the main beneficiaries, you know, who wins, who loses. And as a whole, what does it also mean for democracy? I'm sure this is something that some of the panelists want to discuss. It's, it's kind of a, a hot topic generally with different countries debating what to do about misinformation. Um, and yeah, tying to that first, that, that other question about the, the 2010s and how our perception changed, you know, is there, can we say on balance, if this is sort of, um, if internet tools and digital tools are a net benefit for democracies or autocracies on net? And as well as looking into the future, uh, everyone talking a lot about the rise of artificial intelligence in, um, in general, but also in terms of foreign relations as well, you know, can we see moving on from just the sort of social media world that we're in now with the sort of new, even even newer technologies being implemented? Do we see that changing anything or again, just uh, disrupting or reinforcing hierarchies and how that might play out? All right, and that's yeah. all for me, but thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, we, we turn it back to our moderator. So thank you very much for this presentation. Um, I would like uh, also very much to welcome our audience and I would, would like to explain how we're going to do it with, uh, with the questions because you are of course invited after our first round with the panelists to indulge with us in a, in a Q&A. We'll be very happy to have your questions and to involve you in the discussion. So now it's my, my pleasure to welcome our panelists. So I'll go by alphabetic order. I'm very happy first to introduce uh, Mr. Cornelio Biola. He is Associate Professor in Diplomatic Studies at the University of Oxford and head of the Oxford Digital Diplomacy Research Group. He also serves as a faculty fellow at the Center on Public Diplomacy at the University of Southern California and as a professor, professional lecturer at the Diplomatic Academy of Vienna. Welcome, Mr. Biola. It's great to have you with us. Thank you very much for the invitation. Pleasure um, second panelist is Mr. Nicholas J. Cull. He is a professor of communication, Global Communication Policy Fellow, Center for Communication Leadership and Policy at USC Annenberg. From 2004 to 2019, he served as president of the International Association for Media and History, and he is originally from the United Kingdom. Um, welcome, Mr. Cull. It's great to have you with us. Ms. Ojoma Ochai is managing partner of the creative economy practice at Co-Creation Lab in Lagos, Nigeria. The hub's mission is to promote intra-African and global trade and collaboration that will stimulate African creative economy growth through re research, advocacy, ecosystem development, investment readiness, and other projects to stimulate innovation and technology adoption in the sector. Ms. Ochai is also a member of the UNESCO expert panel on the 2005 Convention on Cultural Expressions 
and has worked with many institutions like the Swedish Arts Council, the World Bank, and others over the last 15 years. Welcome, Ms. Ochai. Great to have you with us. And looking forward very much to hear about this very interesting experience, I believe. Thank last but not least, you. last but not least, we have Mr. Manushir Shamsrizi. He is a co-founder of Humboldt University to Berlin Games Lab and the co-founder of the UNOS Center for Social Business and Values at Lufana University Lüneburg. He's a former Ariane de Rothschild Fellow of Innovative Social Entrepreneurship at the University of Cambridge and Global Justice Fellow at Yale University. He has a primary background in political philosophy, holding a Master of Public Policy. So I also welcome very much Mr. Shamsrizi and I think having also a philosophical approach to this might be very rewarding. So let me start with my first question to Ms. Ochai. Ms. Ochai, the last two years where we all, the world experienced an incredible change or maybe you also can say an incredible crisis uh, with COVID-19 and we all were forced to rely very much on digital tools. So what was the impact of the, of, on the international cultural relations of the COVID-19 pandemic and the increased use of digital tools? Thanks very much for that, um, Samir. It's, it's very good to be here and hello to everyone on the line. I think certainly sat in Lagos in Nigeria and, and thinking about this from an African perspective, the last couple of years certainly have seen um, a lot more people online uh, for, for obvious reasons, for reasons of the pandemic. And when I reflect on what impact it has had on international cultural relations, I suppose I think of it you know, fundamentally and going back to sort of what does international cultural um, relations try to do, right? It's about building understanding and building friendship and affinity. Um, and ultimately, it's about soft power and influence. And I think the thing that we're seeing, and as our colleagues who are presenting the, the, the paper were talking, is certainly more reach. And the fact that the space has certainly seen a lot more access for people to engage in all these cross-border dialogues. And we've seen that with that reach, increased reach is certainly more engagement in matters of international cultural relations, where in the past uh, and pre-COVID and, and maybe a few years before COVID, there were really strong interlocutors in this international cultural cooperation and in this international dialogues, it has felt a lot like that mediation and those structures of mediation are breaking down to the point where you're seeing trends where citizens and individuals are increasingly empowered as agents of international cultural relations. It's not by consensus, it's not by, they haven't been appointed to do it. I think just by virtue of being online, having an audience, we're seeing a lot more diversity in the sort of representation, particularly of young Africans in matters of representation of them internationally. So I think that has certainly uh, changed in certainly with COVID. I think even before COVID though, we were seeing a lot of power going into the hands of young Africans, for example. So I'll give you an example. The tragic, tragic Ethiopia air plane crash that happened um, a few years ago. When it happened initially, there was the initial uh, narrative of something that had gone wrong because Ethiopia Air, an African airline had done something wrong. That was the initial narrative that broke out. But within hours, there was an immediate backlash on social media from young people amplifying the, in what was initially a less obvious narrative about the airplane manufacturer Boeing and their role in that disaster where I feel like were it not for the platform of digital and so many young African voices being on the internet and being able to counter that narrative about themselves and their, you know, where they're from, 
that wouldn't have happened, certainly not as quickly. So I feel like what we were seeing pre-COVID and certainly with COVID in the digitization and that increased access is just more voice and more agency to the average person on the internet with a phone that's able to challenge narratives about themselves and representations of themselves. So I think that's certainly what we're seeing. I think the question remains though about how does that convert to influence? How does that convert to soft power? And I think the jury is still out on that because I, I don't think we've been in this reality long enough to yeah. know whether that reach, that increased reach, that increased engagement will actually translate to what international cultural relations actually tries to address fundamentally. Yeah, thank you very much. I would like to, um, to give a, a question to each panelist. And then, of course, I also would welcome it very much if you would, would discuss amongst each other, of course. So, so but I would, because I would like to follow with Mr. Biola on what you just said, because you, you talked about an increase of numbers, an increase of views. But the question always is does this lead, does the greater reach lead to better? outcomes. So that would be my question to, to Mr. Biola to start with. And um, having, having this wider uh, use and, and, and a lot more people uh, being able to participate, does this um, le lead to better, better results and um, to higher quality? Well, um, I'm more skeptical that about the fact that the pandemic has facilitated an increase of positive cultural relations. And I think um, um, from what I've seen in the past year and uh, published as well, researched, is that we've seen a lot of the dark side, actually. And we've seen, for instance, the, the problem of uh, conspiracy storytelling becoming entrenched, entrenched in the digital medium. And why is that important? Because then, you know, uh, the way in which you try to promote cultural relations, um, it's supposed first, you know, to, uh, it, it, uh, it interferes in the, in, the, uh, in the space. It becomes more difficult for you to reach out to others and try to have, you know, a more positive uh, uh, element. Uh, uh, so at least in the first stage of the pandemic, we've seen this kind of cooperation breaking down. Um, and the rise of, of, of conspiracy storytelling, uh, which we're still trying to, to fight with. So that's one aspect, uh, which I think it's problematic on the positive side. And this is another study that um, is due for publication uh, soon. Uh, I think what we uh, witness, it's a major trend. Uh, we're moving a little bit past the social media, to a certain extent, to something new. Uh, the pandemic broke the taboo of virtual engagement, and meaning you know, these kind of platforms. Um, and we've seen, for instance, from the discussion that we, and the survey that we've done in the number of people working um, uh, on platforms that uh, they prefer this kind of virtual engagements to continue. Um, so there are certain conditions that allow virtual communication actually to expand. So you have these kinds of two contradictory trends, one in which the dark side has uh, polluted Severely, uh, severely, you know, the environment. On the other hand, we have a, a particular reaction in which cultural relations, especially, uh, have, have continued to, 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 to strengthen, but through the virtual medium. And I think this virtual aspect um, is it's, uh, it's likely to, to prosper um, uh, from what we've seen uh, after the pandemic is over. Um, we are talking about probably a concept that uh, it's worth paying attention the rise of hybrid cultural relations in which you have to combine not only you know, the, the, the digital, but also the physical. You have to develop policy of how this kind of integration continues. Uh, so that, these are my primary thoughts on, on how the pandemic affected cultural relations, these two contradictory trends, uh, which we're still, uh, we, we still uh, uh, coping, trying to, to find a solution to them. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Kull, I would like to follow with uh, something that Mr. Biola just said, uh, speaking about the dark side. And the dark side has been there before COVID. And we saw the dark side quite clearly uh, with the Brexit. And we saw it quite clearly with the uh, US uh, elections in, in, in 2016. And I guess many other countries, maybe these are the most famous examples, but many other countries would reclaim and that's also one problem because 
um, a lot of dictatorships reclaim that things happened and maybe they didn't happen. And I, I would also like to come to this later concerning uh, what Mr. Knudsen said, who wins at the end, because I think this is an extremely interesting topic. But now really the dark side has been there before. So, so um, why is it so, um, why is it so difficult to control the dark side and what chain, what, what chances do we have in external cultural policy to, yeah, to, to stand against this and to be a positive light against the darkness? <laughs> yes, well, first thing to say is that you're absolutely correct. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, as a, as a historian, I, I, I see propaganda and media disruption as being an element of international relations, not a moment in international relations. It's always been with us. And there's kind of a fantasy that people live in that propaganda was somehow invented in uh, by Russians in uh, 2014. Yeah. Uh, and I find this ridiculous. But what, what, I, what, I, what I would say is that there, there's a special problem right now. And, and that is with the speed with which uh, falsehoods can circulate. Um, the uh, rapidity with which they can be generated. And th this has not been the case with previous um, uh, previous uh, falsehood. In fact, uh, you know, I, I think with every new media, it goes back to um, uh, you, you not only lose something from the past, but something's revived. And what we have now is, is the, the kind of ready invention that was possible in the old marketplace, where you can just make up a rumor, repeat it, and instead of just being around the marketplace in half an hour, it's around the world in, in, a, in half an hour. So uh, I, see th I see this as, as a problem. But I think that um, we need to look back at previous moments of media disruption. What troubles me when I look at previous moments of media disruption is that they really cause tremendous problem in international relations. Uh, we don't know those problems by the name of the media that was out of joint because the geographies and the personalities of the people involved are more important. So we don't say the war made by the popular press, but the First World War. We don't say that war made by radio and a cinema newsreel being able to, to stir up uh, populations, we call it the Second World War. And we don't talk about uh, the disruption uh, caused by television. Uh, it's easier to talk about the Cold War. Uh, that's the bad news. The good news is that within these moments of disruption, there are also moments of learning and that it is possible to remaster communication, to learn again about our, our collective skepticism and to go through a process. And uh, I, I've been writing recently about the end of the Cold War and um, re-exploring what I call information disarmament. Everybody knows that Reagan and Gorbachev negotiated over nuclear weapons, but it's been completely forgotten that they negotiated over propaganda and they put together a, a hotline system to take disinformation out of Soviet American relations. And I think we need to rediscover um, uh, information disarmament and to accept that there is a multiplayer uh, process that we need to pull information, uh, the information sphere, back into a manageable, um, uh, you know, in, in, into a, a, a manageable place. The other thing that I would say is, um, I, I think that our idea of uh, soft power is wrong uh, because it looks at soft power as a optional extra for the most successful countries. What can the country that has everything add? Oh, why not have a little extra soft power? In this world, this digitally competitive world, um, if you don't have a good information, if you don't, sorry, if you don't have a good reputation, you can lose a province. So I say, don't look at Germany, look at Ukraine. Why did Ukraine start losing provinces? It was because it wasn't known for anything in the world. Nobody, uh, no tears fell outside of Ukraine when they started losing, uh, losing provinces. So to me, reputation uh, is, is now part of security. Uh, 
And what we should start thinking about in terms of our collective strategies is how we can help one another be more secure in our reputations. So that doesn't just mean each country individually works online to develop its reputation, to reach out through culture. It means that we help each other through a collective reputational security to do more. And so I really admire um, uh, the EU versus dis disinformation site for example, as being a way in which collaboratively we can help one another be more secure. And I would like to see cultural uh, programs like that uh, closer to some of the collaborations that have happened within UNESCO, but, but a broad range, not just coming from one uh, source, but from multiple sources so that we all know one another better. And because of that, we are more secure in our reputations. So, um, a lot in there. It was a great, which I guess show, it says it's a great question. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's, and, and actually, actually, although this is against the rule, I want to follow up with one question because because you say that that we should develop together this reputation or we should work on it together, but isn't this a kind of very idealistic way of looking at it? Because it would require that everybody has the same interest of others having having the, the reputation. So how, sure. how can you secure that? Well, what you have to find, if you look at how the First World War ended, how the Second World War ended, how the Cold War ended, it was by nations, not just enemies, but adversaries, accepting that there were shared interests in the world and that everybody was better off working towards those shared objectives. So th that's what I think we need to do is articulate things that we feel are worth working towards together rather than seeing the world as a zero sum game. So sure, it's idealistic, but it's ideals that brought our previous global crises to an end. Uh, and I, I think we have to start thinking about this in terms as a kind of a, um, a world war I for information. Uh, the, the, the levels of disruption and the problems flowing from that uh, are, are now, to me, they're, they're at that kind of scale, especially when um, uh, diseases are having an easier time, as Cornelia was saying, because of uh, entrenched disinformation narratives. This is beyond a joke. Uh, it's something we have to talk honest, honestly about to one another and see what we can do. For, for example, one of the things the Americans did to get the Russians, for a season at least, to stop saying that AIDS was a bioweapon, mm -hmm. was uh, invented by the United States, was to say, if you say that, we will suspend scientific cooperation with the Soviet Union on AIDS, and then on medicine, and then, if necessary, on all science. And that kind of threat of a ratcheting up sanctions in that area of educational exchange prompted Gorbachev to turn off the rumor as if it were as if he were turning off a tap and that is uh, that experience that whole experience has been completely forgotten and it <laughs> so i think we have more options we have more options that we think than we think we do and one of the great fallacies is that a a communications challenge necessarily has a communications uh, response. Sometimes good old traditional diplomacy uh, uh, still has um, gas in the tank to uh, address um, some of these problems. Uh, so unashamedly, you're correct, it is idealistic, but it's the ideals that have worked in the past. And without ideals, you don't get collaboration. People have to be working towards uh, the, 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 uh, the promise of something better than they've known before. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I, 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 I'm totally with you. And I, I would say that um, what you say and what, it's, was, what is really required is a kind of awareness about history. And, what, what, what you, and I think this is something that we need, we really need to develop. And I would like to, to give the question now to Mr. Shamsrizi, who, who wrote in the, in the chat like uh, five minutes ago, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so, so it would be very interesting to know uh, what you were referring to when, when you wrote yes, yes, yes. And I would really like to go, go deeper into the topic because uh, what Mr. Carl just said is like uh, giving the, the example of Gorbachev and, and Reagan, uh, if we if we apply this to today, it means that we really have to reach out to to 
to to countries that we will we, we see as dictatorships like uh, like China and Russia and even Iran and even uh, even maybe Belarus and, uh, and so 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 Mr. Shamsrizi, how how do you see the the possible uh, the ways of implementing this? And and it also the that's question a big question. Um, yeah. Maybe let me yeah. Let me start by, 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 by explaining what I uh, was uh, so enthusiastically saying yes to, uh, that I had to write it three times. Uh, that was Professor Carl's uh, statement on we have to change our thinking of soft power. I could not agree more. Um, we are the perfect learning journey ourselves. When, when I started to, to work as an advisor for the German Federal Council and, and as a fellow at the German Council for Foreign Relations on gaming and its role in international relations, we started by pointing out the potentials for public diplomacy, right? Sending out your narratives in the battle of narratives that we're in, it's a nice thing that you can do it. If you do not do it, then that's fine. The more you look into it though, the more you realize that this is exactly not how soft power works, or at least it doesn't work like this anymore. Um, and that is something that um, I, 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 I was fascinated by, by, by the report. You, you have to know that it was uh, in a, in a pre-printed version. So uh, 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 to say, uh, sent out to the panelists, uh, with which we are very thankful for, I guess. Um, that is really important. And, and I, would, uh, I already made a post earlier, groundbreaking, I believe, empirical work done by uh, Professor Anheyer and, uh, and, and, and Edward Knudsen. But we are still lacking the biggest point in, in all of this because to, to, to formulate it a bit more provocative, who cares in 2021 about official external cultural policies? How many people do you really reach by that? We have, and, and that's something I want to bring in as an example. Um, I, who in the participants is aware of the great meme wars between CNN and the Trump campaign in 2016, or about memes on Reddit, on Fortune, and so on, as a vehicle for cultural uh, 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 narratives at all. I'm, I, I don't see that as a category in many of this research, and, and, and I don't see it in, in most of the political strategies looking at it. Three billion people are playing video games in the broadest definition um, uh, 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 today. This is the single medium that has more people participating than theater, literature, Hollywood, the soccer championship, and whatever combined. It is full of political narratives. There has been a game published end of 2019 in which you, as the protagonist, it was played by dozens of millions of people in the U.S. alone, in which you as a protagonist are fighting the federal government as an elite soldier. And you have to go get yourself, fight yourself the way up to, to Capitol Hill because the government, I'm not kidding you, is using a pandemic situation to take away citizen rights. China has been publishing and financing a game that's called Anti-Japan War Online in freaking 2008 with the aim of, and that's in the gaming, in the text in that games when you started, with educating the Chinese youth about how evil Japanese humans are and why it's pretty okay to fight them. Now, my fear in all of this is that um, in all of these uh, uh, conferences and settings we're coming together, we are quite optimistically discussing about what can the Goethe Institute do, right? How should public diplomacy look like? And then we leave and we have a huge self-selection problem because we only reach out to the people that I, I'm provocative here, would even come in a non-pandemic time if we would say the Goethe Institute is offering a, a, a nice wine tasting, right? How do we reach the dozens of yeah. millions of young people that are on Twitch, on Discord, in esport tournaments, 
uh, getting the news via memes, we do not even monitor this kind of, 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 of things. China's Tencent is strategically buying shares in gaming publishing studios all around the world. We've seen bipartisan initiative by the US Congress Professor Karl can, can, can say something on this and Professor Anheyer uh, as well, much, much better than I could ever say how uncommon bipartisan initiatives uh, have become. We've seen one in aggressively pointing out to Activision Blizzard, one of the world's leading gaming publishing companies in California, saying that you cannot shut down players in your eSport tournaments that are shouting free Hong Kong just because parts of your companies are owned by China. I'm, I'm, I'm staying provocative here. Yeah. I would believe the waste, the, the majority of external cultural policies that we have to only reach out to people that somehow would be able to uh, inform themselves anyway and, and, and they are of no big help in fighting the amount of disinformation, fake news, deep fakes. By now we have produced enough video material in this call alone to come up with 100% realistic deep fakes. I, I, uh, I could have the moderator make an anti-Semitic statement tomorrow and it wouldn't be him, but nobody could Identify that. We are not prepared in monitoring. We are not prepared in even understanding where this, this, this battle of narrative takes place. It's certainly not the nice Twitter conversation between uh, uh, Goethe Institute and other uh, uh, institutions like this. They are doing amazing work. You, you, you get what I mean, right? Yeah. That's my fears. Thank you very much. I, I have a, um, uh, Mr. Biola would like to reply. I would just to sum up by saying something more provocative somehow, because what you just said is that we are the cultural elite somehow, and we are forming an echo chamber of our own, where we speak about these things and we are we lost touch to reality. And I just can say me as being a traditional filmmaker somehow, we, we get all this also because we're told that the traditional cinema is dying and 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 films are are just more and more becoming an elite thing as you you yourself stated and and we are we are just playing with the for, with an art form that's yeah that's that's becoming more and more obsolete so so which is, which is a beautiful thing because we have all this transmedia uh, uh, you know uh, everything collaborating uh, of course uh, uh, i'm just saying do not leave the biggest medium out there uh, out of the conversation just because you're not used to it yeah thank you very much mr biola you wanted to you wanted yeah, to I, reply. I, I just wanted to connect you know the, the the two conversation you know between nicolas and mr chamrizi because i think mr chamrizi points uh, out something very important which i think it was mentioned at the beginning uh, that one defining feature of what we see nowadays of the digital age is the question of speed. Speed is tremendously important in our discussion here. And why is that? Because it creates social pathologies. What do I mean? That certain domains are speedable, they move fast, and certain domains are not able to stay as quick to, to catch up with that. So they have this kind of gaps between uh, and this is what we see nowadays, that information moves much, much faster. And we have domains that, you know, that transform themselves quite quickly. I mean, the gaming sector, for instance, is one thing, but also being infiltrated by, by, by uh, these new uh, uh, attitudes towards the information. And on the other hand, cultural relations doesn't seem to be able, in a sense, as a domain to keep up with, uh, so we have a gap, and I think you know, have to think very carefully about you know how to bridge this speed problem, uh, those speed gap. Nick says that you know one solution is to build you know uh, reputational shields. Um, this is a tremendous ambitious project, uh, but I think you know it's it's something to, uh, to 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 look at the mechanics of that. What I see on the other hand that the speed gap that I'm talking about is moving in a different direction. And what's the direction that we see governments talking is this new concept of technological sovereignty, protecting the information space, which, if it takes into its ultimate logic, actually is going to break down the mission of cultural relations of, you know, connecting with each other. 
So uh, EU is talking about technological sovereignty, is concluding agreements, right? In the discussion, for instance, on Brexit two weeks ago, uh, one of the sanctions that was mentioned by the EU is to cut the data flow to the, uh, to the UK in case, you know, they don't respect the protocol. So I think there is this new concept of technological sovereignty that seems to be more appealing, you know, for some of the actors in terms of creating a safe space, right, a safe space for intercultural communication. Uh, that's one avenue in which this structural issue that I mentioned, the gap of certain sectors moving away, uh, and this information is moving, is transforming, is mutating very fast, and those areas that are not able to catch up as quickly as uh, uh, they, uh, many would like, you know, um, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the speed of technological transformation. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Mr. thank you very much, Mr. Carl. Thank you. Uh, I, I wanted to jump in and um, uh, uh, well, both say that I'm I'm very glad uh, that uh, Manucha is talking about the power of games because I've uh, I, absolutely this is uh, not only changing. Um, how people it, it well it changes how people see the world and also provides sort of narratives for understanding our our our, our, our passage through uh, the, the 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 world around us and um, a, a example here the game red or dead um, had recently to change its rules because people were going and massacring Indians uh, uh, Native Americans um, just because they could. And this was disrupting the game because at a later stage of the game, you need to ask the Native Americans for advice. So uh, the problem was people had murdered all the, all the Native Americans in their village. And so you couldn't go to the village and partner with it. So they had to make it impossible to bring uh, handguns into the, um, into, into the village. Uh, so this, but, you know, there are, are, are problems um, uh, uh, baked into uh, game design that we need to think about. Uh, but I wanted to say, and this builds on something Ojama said, uh, talking about the digital empowerment of, of people in Africa uh, pushing back in new ways, is that, that where I feel more optimistic is when I see how just making digital platforms available has changed the voices that we hear in, in society. And uh, three groups that I've, I've looked at and, and I'm, I'm sure uh, uh, can, can, can um, show uh, are having more of a say are um, diasporic groups, uh, are indigenous groups, uh, where there are now ind indigenous peoples empowering run at one another. So partnerships between uh, indigenous people in Australia and, and the Amazon and working with Native Americans in US, Canada, Mexico, uh, and LGBTI uh, groups. And you know, some people who, who are in all of those categories who have become voices on the international stage. And I think what's interesting about that is that they were all people who were neglected largely by legacy media and who had this sort of pent up de uh, need to communicate, who have seized on these new um, uh, outlets in, uh, exciting, in exciting ways. So uh, I, I see both, um, both good and bad in the, uh, in, in the, the digital mix. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very happy that we're having this lively discussion. I would like to give the word to Mr. Shamsrizi and then if Ms. Ochai has something to add, and then I would like to open uh, the panel for the, for the public. So uh, please go ahead, Mr. Shamsrizi. Uh, I'm sorry, this is not. Um, uh, I hope this is not getting boring. But but I once again uh, want want to agree with Professor Carl and, and build up on that. Um, it is, I believe, exp it is very interesting. I do not have empirical data, right? But but from the work we're doing, um, it is really interesting to see how specifically minoritized groups are uh, more innovative in using the technologies that are out there um, and um, and they're having a real impact. So I, I'm saying this because I don't want to, to, to sound, sound too negative. I, I bring you one example, um, fascinating project, um, the uncensored library uh, of uh, Reporters Without Borders in Minecraft, which allows you access in game to books that are censored and as long as you have access to the internet and you can play this game, um, 
that you 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 do not that what I what I was talking about earlier that that nobody is looking at the world of gaming as as the home of of the kids and and of many people all around the world having the risks. It also has this potential that many, many authoritarian states uh, worldwide do not even think about censoring Minecraft, freaking Minecraft. Why would they do that? Well, now that has turned Minecraft into a place where you can access uh, a literature that 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 is uh, forbidden. You can get information. Opposition parties are are, are connecting. Uh, the diaspora communities are, are connecting there. So there is also this positive use of of this new technology and. Both the risks and the chances, I believe, uh, should should pressure us into thinking way beyond the traditional uh, 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 media. Uh, this because this is not not what what the use is using. Uh, just think of the metaverse, right? Whenever you you're looking at at whatever empirical data or, or, or policy uh, uh, recommendations, uh, uh, maybe check. Do they talk about the metaverse? Are they aware of full immersive virtual reality? Are they including Minecraft uh, and so on and so on? So that's a, a recommendation. Um, and again, Professor Anheyer, Edward Knudsen, I know it's hard enough uh, to come up with the empirical data you have collected, but still I believe it's just a very, very small spot uh, uh, and not even the most important one uh, uh, yet. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Ms. Ochai. Yes, I was going to just make two quick points. Um, I think what you were saying there, Manusha, about the, the role of institutions, traditional institutions like the GOTA, like the British Council and the diminishing agency that they have. I feel like one of the things that we need to pay more attention is as that agency and, and influence of those kinds of institutions diminish, where is that influence going to? And I think to, to echo what you're saying is we need to start looking at the streamers and the commissioning editors of those streamers and what they're commissioning. We need to be looking at, you know, all these gaming companies. We need to be looking at the platforms, the algorithms that determine what you see and what gets visit, you know, what gets amplified. I feel like we need to turn our attention to those as the, the real emerging agents of international cultural relations, because that's where the power lies. So I just wanted to make that point. A second point I wanted to make was just this idea of whether the idea, the bilateral relations are still possible in this world that we live in. Because certainly reading the reports and, and reflecting on how the channels of communication and engagement flow, it feels in this digital world, it's just, it's not possible, at least to my reckoning, that we can have bilateral relations because everything is now multilateral. And I suppose, what does that mean therefore for international cultural relations? And how does that fundamentally change the way in which the connections and collaborations happen around the world? So in, I know that there were a set of questions at the end of the research, but that's one question that I think we also need to consider in this emerging digital world. Thanks, Samir, that's all for me. Thank you, thank you so much, all of you. Um, do we have questions? Somebody who would like to participate just by stating his or her question? I see that Christine Wilson has her hand up, if that helps. Hi. Hello. Hi, I'm Christine. I'm, a, I'm Director of Research uh, Policy Insight at the British Council, and uh, good to see you all. And my, my former colleague, Ojoma, it's great to hear from you. I mean, OJ, this is actually a question for you, kind of in light of what a lot of what's been and I think your point about those sh that shifting power of the traditional cultural relations organisations such as the British Council, thinking then for your thoughts about how, how do those traditional organisations, if they want to flourish, if they want to stay in place, how do they strike up new relations? What are those new boundaries for cultural relations policy and practice? where those um, those organizations can still play a role if, if indeed you think they can. Oh gosh, hi, hi Christine. Shall I jump in Samir and, and go for it? Good to see you, Please Christine. Um, so I, I think one of the things that we, certainly on the continent that we feel is a lot of the intermediation, if you took higher education, for example, 10 years ago, if you wanted to go to school in the UK and you were sat somewhere in Lagos or Nairobi or wherever, you needed the British Council 
to help you filter through the information of what opportunities there were, pros and cons, what cities, all of those things that you would consider when going to school. You can do it now, right? Just by going on Google or, or searching for it and determining based on what you find. Um, I think the thing with that context, though, where there's so many sources of information, I feel a time will come when conversely there'll be a need for curation and traditional institutions like the British Council, previously traditional institutions, then have a curation role to almost, um, I don't want to say verify um, or endorse, but I think that's where the role becomes. So it's not about them being the agents of cultural relations themselves. It's about them putting a stamp of, of something, credibility or something, on some of the actual players and agents, which then gives the credibility that then shapes what that international relationship might look like. So I, to my mind, at least, that's a, a potential future role for more... That's like the, the, the old idea of a good office. And I think you can see that happening in international broadcasting where um, uh, we, we're now seeing people coming to understand that all news is not created equally and that you don't judge news based on is it exciting to read, but who's saying it? And so we know that the BBC has a special credibility, so it's valued as a news brand. And uh, as people become more discerning in what they share, uh, I, I, I think that there's a role right there for, uh, for governments in validate. And this is why it's so important that standards are maintained in government news and why it was so appalling that the Trump administration tried to politicize US external broadcasting in, in their final year. Big mistake. Thank you very much for your, for your question, Ms. Wilson. And I would like to go, give the word to Mr. Asim al-Dafrawi. Ahlan, <laughs> you're welcome. Ahlan, <laughs> So quick introduction, I'm a political scientist who's working on the intersection of media and politics and also social media. So I think the curating idea was um, quite important in the sense that we'll do more and more cross-media. So we have like, uh, for instance, like all these foreign broadcasters who will be obliged at some stage to not only do curating, but to also their own curating stuff. Then um, I raised my hand for this other um, very exciting point about video games or internet games, whatever we call them. I mean, um, the thing is, um, I mean, a couple of people are aware um, how important they are. I mean, I, 12 years ago, I wrote um, a small uh, policy paper about how to counter jihadi propaganda and so on. And we found this Jordanian guy who was doing video games, you know, to, to break down the jihadi narrative, which was very important at this point of time. And nobody really took up this idea worldwide. So the big question is like, how do you get to political decision makers and explain them how important gaming is? Um, it's not only, but not only gaming, but concrete applications, you know, in terms of intercultural foreign policy. Um, how do we make people aware that we need to finance um, not only learning games, but very simple learning applications and so on? So. How do we get our message across? This is my big question. Thank you. Maybe I can jump, jump on that. Um, there are two things in this. So first of all, uh, congratulations for being far ahead uh, compared to... to, to, to <laughs> not, anymore, not, anymore, not anymore, not anymore, not anymore. I think what, what has worked for us in... in, in, in the, um, the, uh, the U.S. has been doing a lot of things in public diplomacy uh, in, in, in gaming. Um, uh, Germany is now doing quite a bit. What is helping, in, in my experience, is pure comparison of numbers. Once you have been able to introduce a political decision maker to the sheer amount of people that are playing video games every day, and then let her or him compare that to the budget uh, and the amount of time his organization is spending in reaching far less people, that's one way to, to make it happen. A second argument that works quite well is um, be a bit shocking. I shared the BBC link earlier because uh, uh, I, uh, I, I realized it works quite well. 
building up yet again on what Professor Cole said, soft power is not a nice, um, a nice to have anymore and maybe has never been. But in a way, in, in a world in which the British Ministry of Defense warns that the amount of organizations that are able to build up offensive cyber capacities attacking critical infrastructures like production of medicine by downloading a freaking video game like StarCraft 2 for 89 euros and thus getting access to highly developed narrow AI, which 10 years ago only states were able to develop, that leaves a mark. That is not soft power uh, anymore we're talking about. That is defense policy suddenly. I have a final footnote to this. Um, I'm not at all a fan of producing own games. I, I get it that the creative community is highly interested in this because, of course, it's the way uh, of uh, being creative with this medium. But again, this soft power, uh, this, this serious game approach, which is a very continental European one, the US for many years is, is calling this games for impact and is thinking of this differently. The serious gaming approach usually does not lead to the impact we need. It does not lead to the chance we are looking for, you have been describing uh, Jihad as an example, to reach out to, to the people who are influenced by narratives and to win in the battle of narratives. These games are usually produced by a huge amount of taxpayers' money and they reach, to be honest, maybe a few hundred, if you're lucky, a few thousand people. Out of that, 80% might be students of political sites. Yeah, While they are playing... Is my Assassin's mic Creed my mic out there still? and Assassin's Creed has dozens of millions of people that the narratives are, 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 are reaching to. So we need to be on Discord, we need to be on Twitch, we need to do the counter or the contextualization uh, where the other narrative is. That won't work with these serious games. So, I mean, obviously government actors cannot develop great games, you know. So it, it, the question is, like, how can we make the gaming industry in the sense of obviously we yeah. talked about um, yeah. so last I give week. you an example uh, on, on, wait, wait. how can we make them more responsible if you look yeah. at um, game narratives it's um, mostly about violence you know there's some exceptions like Minecraft which is still at the end quite violent how can we make them more responsible and um, um, bind them into a common effort you know to um, do really like uh, no zero sum games you know um, win win games and so on you know this is this is I think one of the major challenges yeah. Um, so, so thoughts on this and also on, on what, what, what Mr. Iho Safchak has, 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 has changed. I know I'm well, very well aware of Games for Change and, and, and know them and they're doing incredibly work. But yet again, the serious games have not proven to be an, a, a really impactful tool in the battle of narratives. Not while China is via Tencent buying and, and influencing narratives of games that are reaching out to hundreds of millions of people. Um, it is collaboration that is needed, I believe, in the gaming industry because the gaming industry is in a very good position from their perspective. They, they tend to think of themselves as a cultural medium as long as that benefits them. Right, they are at the same level like literature and theater. As soon as someone reach out to them and tell them why are you portraying Bolivia the way you do, I, I shared that link earlier that the government of Bolivia has has, has, has sent an official note to the French government about a game that has been produced in France. Suddenly, these big international corporations are entertainment studios with no responsibility for political uh, 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 narratives whatsoever. There are statements out there that we as a foreign policy or foreign culture policy community would not at all accept from any book publisher. We would not accept from Netflix. We would not accept from Hollywood. Somehow the gaming industry still is able to slippy slope its way between um, now I'm culturally important, now I'm just entertainment, the political dimension is, is, is not of importance to us. That is not how this works. Serious games is not the solution, I believe, it's collaboration and regulation. Look at the International Red Cross, which has, after many years of, of just pointing out, you should not use violence in video games, which has no impact whatsoever, collaborated with gaming industry saying, can we help you to make the video games better by making them more realistic? by introducing humanitarian uh, law 
And suddenly, when gamers got in-game negative effects of a check when attacking a United Nations car or a Red Cross building, that's how you get the message across. Not by coming up with your own games that are only played with people you would have reached otherwise anyway. I'm sorry, I'm 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 I'm, I'm very clear on this point uh, um, from from my view. Okay, so. Mr. Bueller, do you have a, a, a reply to this? And then we have two more, um, two more questions. Actually, actually, three more questions. Um, I'm, I just, I, we, we will be a little bit late, but I guess it's okay because it's very, it's very interesting. And I guess that uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Anheil just told me that he has to leave. We well, would like to thank him very much for his input and, and for, for being with us tonight. So. Um, yeah, but yeah. we need to take care of the time. So let's try to be very, very focused so that we maybe take 10 more minutes. I very hope this is okay for the, everyone. Very briefly, on the question that was raised before, whether the government could be made more aware of the problem that may arise from, from a gaming. Uh, um, I think uh, one issue that you know transpires from the way in which governments react, uh, and we've seen they adapt, they adapt. Ministry of Foreign Affairs governments usually adapt. Uh, for instance, what happened with information in 2015, 2016, they need to see effect. And I regret to say that, yes, the fact that 3 billion people, 3 million people, you know, 3 billion people play games, they haven't seen that much of effect in terms of how the government policy is being affected. When we talk about the conspiracies uh, that affected the way in which people vaccinate or refuse you know, to uh, take uh, COVID seriously, that was not a result of games. That was a result of- Sharing a link with Pfizer using gaming by, for by, vaccination by, by. right now. That's a sorry, no, no, that's what not I'm the saying state of that the effect is a little bit more muted in comparison with other strategic priorities. I'm not saying that the games cannot lead to that effect. I'm just saying that this is the reason why they may not pay enough attention because they don't see that kind of big impact with Brexit, with US election in 2016. They see that what happened online mutated into something offline. So that connection is not always obvious. You know, you may say, well, you know, you can make it more obvious, no question about it. Uh, so that's that's why uh, sometimes you know I mean the, the reaction is probably less less visible in terms of how to deal with that. After 2014, Mining Ministry of Foreign, uh, Foreign Affairs established strategic communication units to deal with the problem that they noticed. So the uh, becoming more aware of uh, of uh, of uh, uh, the negative impact of of games that's uh, something that uh, has to be made more visible, right? I mean it's not uh, uh, cannot be taken for granted. Okay, thank you so much. I would like to give uh, the word to Mr. Gerla Hansen, um, please, with short question and somehow a short answer so that we can make it to in, in 10 minutes because we have two more questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, um, basically, it's about serious gaming. I, I'm working in the Danish Cultural Institute and I have worked the last six years uh, uh, also on, on, uh, on gaming and I had a collaboration with Mojang and and UN Habitat on serious gaming, um, uh, using Minecraft. And I, but I have also followed all the various attempts to make uh, commercially some, some games which uh, address uh, environment. And, and that has not been so successful, I have to, to say. So I, I am very suspicious at how serious gaming is, is right now working, you know, for the benefit or going in, 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 a, in an interesting direction. But I have not given up. I do actually think that you can do narratives uh, in serious gaming. We can appeal to a lot, but it does require enormous amount of skill and art, you know, talent, which has not had the chance to unfold. And I think one of the issues is that games, they are not, you know, there's a, in, in Europe in particular, there's a lot of money invested in, in film production from the public side and in other areas and to some so, I mean, I think, I think this is also an issue of whether you want to give up uh, chances for independent game developers uh, who, who would take this serious gaming up in a serious way. <laughs> so maybe a comment on that. I mean, I, I, I say I, 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 do, I do feel I speak from also basis of experience of, of doing stuff in this field and, and with some of these big games also. Okay, Th thank you. Thank you very much for your input. So now we have... Miss Noamine Nganjiro, I hope I, I, I 
somehow almost. spelled almost. it right. <laughs> almost. I tried. I tried uh, my oh, best. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Noemi Jagiro. I'm hello everyone. I'm the head of the Goethe Institute San Francisco. And before that, I worked for about eight years in Kenya and in South Africa, always about and on digitization projects. And two things I just wanted to state. One is that I feel it's super important to differentiate between cultural relations and public diplomacy, because what we do at the Goethe Institute, I would say, is not public diplomacy. It's, it's cultural relations. And what that means is that it's very, very important to have a two-way street or to work multidirectional, to work bottom-up, to try not to have an agenda, or if there is, be open about it and talk about it. And what that also means is that it, it um, creates an urgency for physicality and for presence. And I'm saying that working in San Francisco, working on all kinds of digital platforms, we're even starting a new project about this, the, the importance and the quality of relationship you get in a, in a physical face-to-face -face, in-person meeting is, is something else than what you get online and virtually up till now. Maybe in a few years it will be different, but um, that informs the kind of relationships we have internationally. And it's I, I would be afraid of letting go of that yet and i would be interested to find more find out more about how is quality of relationship um affected if we go more digitally and we we heard about the reach the, the reach is increased that is very true but um to what cost who are we reaching we can be more targeting that's that's uh, great but my experience of the last two years here in the bay area is that it's a very different quality of relationships that we are building and what we need is is good relationships that hold for years and for decades, especially in, in this world where we can and where we need to build bridges. So I would find it very important um, to, to hear more about the quality change that is maybe happening or how we can restore this kind of connectedness and, and good quality to relationships, even if we work uh, more virtually. Thank you. I don't think it's the one thing or the other, if, if I might jump, jump on on that. Uh, and, and, and I've never heard someone saying it's the one thing or the other. Um, it's just like, think of it as broadening the, the, the tools you have, right? For example, last two years, I know quite well from many good institutes we work with as, as Humboldt University, um, and you know much better, many of them were not able to do the projects they usually would like to do. Is it really better not to be able to do anything or put that into the metaverse? That's the one thing. The other is, are we really inclusive when we only do physical events? Is it not a bit elitistic to say if a young group of people play an esports no tournament, one is saying those that. are no, different, no one is a saying transgender, that. No one is saying that. someone who is yeah. physically disabled yeah. comes together at one team, and then there's us saying that has not the same value, the way you treat your friendship, the community you have built, is not the same for us as if you would do that physically. I just warned for that F final. But I hear final you, but no one is saying that. Uh, no one is saying that that we do either or. I'm just saying what we experience is that people approach us and say, and it's people, it's the engineers, it's the people from Facebook, from Google. When can you be physical again? When can we yes, meet yes. in I, person? I, I, I get it that. Is, I get there's that. an element that that we cannot. I ignore. get that. And it's I just think, like yeah. we're really good in doing physical things. That's not. That's for me at least not what I'm what i'm concerned about i'm concerned about someone is doing the online communities if it's not the traditional actors that are involved it's not their narratives it's not their context right and i i feel also bad final thought about being too moral i see that with my own students a, a few weeks ago i had a young female student 19 18 years old i have not heard a word from her uh, this semester but when i introduced her to the argumentation of the international olympic committee on why they believe that e-sport right competitive gaming is is, is, is of no value to the trade and, and doesn't teach any traditional value compared to the analog sport she got really angry saying i do not understand which values the offline world is teaching me that my online community is not. Is it corruption and human rights issues in Qatar with, with soccer? Is it uh, a sexism in the equestrian sport? What values are out there that they, old white men, are telling me that my friends and I do not experience real enough when we meet online? That is something I'm afraid about because then we lose those people. Yeah.
Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm really sorry that I uh, somehow have to, have to have to cut it here. I would, uh, Mr. Carl, I would, they, I have one question that Mr. Ringo asked like 15 minutes ago. And I think it's the perfect question to, to end with, in, with a very short answer, because he says, how can traditional actors of external cultural relations improve their ability and speed to monitor and to react to these developments? Right. What, con what concrete measures? So maybe well, could, we I, can could have... I say yeah. one, one thing that I think we need to know? Um, I, I think we need to uh, research, always with public diplomacy, cultural relations, it begins with listening. And one of the things we need to understand is what does the world think about digital disruption? If I say to you, country X is putting out disinformation, has fake accounts, has uh, trolls working online, does world opinion of that country decrease? If I talk about a country that's abusing uh, video gaming spaces, does our opinion of that country decrease? Because otherwise we could be completely wasting our time in our, um, in our efforts to uh, explain what's going on. If people don't care that uh, information is being weaponized, the flip side is if we can show that people do care, that people want, if you like, communication hygiene in, in the information space, they want good behavior, then we have a price. There's a public price. There's leverage against bad actors. And yeah. people, uh, 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 and so the uh, work to show that work that, for example, that Corn I know Cornelio has done this work, showing exactly documenting bad behavior by states, putting out multiple narratives to confuse um, what the world thinks about a particular issue, then they have a price beyond the money they're paying to the troll. The fact they're paying a troll becomes part of their price, and it's worth our while talking about it. So to me, this is an essential part of what our research should be, to find out, do people care? Because I, th I th my instinct is that they do care, but we don't run research projects and diplomatic initiatives based on instinct. We need to have data and clear indications of uh, the, the um, uh, expectations of international behavior in information space. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Biola, a very short statement and then... <laughs> yeah. okay. Just to, uh, to conclude here, I mean, the, the answer to, to answer the question that was raised about Goethe, you know, how to improve this communication, I think the model of cultural relations has to be uh, uh, rethought. In what sense? Until now, there is this kind of objective that is, is uh, it's, uh, it's uh, selected to be pursued, and then the digital is an add-on, how to get there. I think digital has to come first. Where are uh, what what are the digital mediums in the first that are trending, that are important, whether gaming or, or or social media or the multiverse? What is the medium? Where are my audiences? And then uh, with this kind of digital first approach, then you have to uh, to to structure you know your approach in terms of you know uh, the content and the, uh, the, the the objectives. But I think exactly the reverse uh, direction has to be pursued nowadays. Digital comes first and the objectives, you know, and uh, uh, have to, to follow and adapt to this particular context. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for this really engaged and, and, and so lively discussion. I think we have so many issues that we raised and, and we could go on for, for much longer. So uh, thank you very much for your participation to our panelists. Thank you very much for the Hurti School for, their, for, for, for having us. And I would now... Uh, thank you for the audience, also for their participation. I would like now give the world uh, word to Miss Odila Triebel. Thank you for having us, and yeah, thank yeah. you. Very, very short. Thank you very much too. Um, yeah, um, to make it uh, make it short, but I think it's always a proof of a very good discussion when we actually yeah run out of time. So um, I think it was it was wonderful. Um, yeah, and I just join in in all the thanks to the panelists, the the moderator, and the team of IFA behind um, behind this this evening discussion, um, and the Hertie School, the audience, and I think to to wrap wrap up in in more with only one thought and and bridging from this discussion the the digital outlook to the ECP monitor. I think what what became very clear from also what from Ojoma Okrai brought in that we need to add new 
new new powers to the geography of international relations. And so maybe we should think about having other country reports adding to the ECP monitor for sure, but also maybe a, a, a report not about another country, but uh, about tech companies and very powerful um, individuals who um, can be powerful because um, they don't need any interlocutors and mediators any any longer. So thank you very much for this intriguing discussion. Um, please allow me again, if you would like to be informed about uh, a new country report brought up, uh, follow us on Twitter, IFA Cult Extern. And if you have any questions or remarks on the monitor or new data, um, write to us at research at IFA.de. And uh, yeah, it would be wonderful to meet sometime again and discuss again and try how we can build alliances of reputation for security reasons and peace. Thank you very much. Have a good evening.